All right, welcome everyone to the MacKids Streaming Schoolhouse. Thank you for joining us for our second class. My name is Katie Halada and I work in the School and Library Marketing Department at Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Today for our Streaming Schoolhouse, we are joined by two guest science, te science teachers, Angela Dominguez and Maris Wicks. They're on the camera now. Give a wave to everyone, Angela and Maris. Before I turn things over to these two incredibly talented creators, we just have a few housekeeping items that we want to share with attendees. The first is that if you are new to Zoom webinars, just know that the only people you'll be able to hear and see are myself and Angela and Maris. We won't be able to hear or see you and you won't be able to hear or see any of your fellow attendees either. So no need to worry about any video or audio interference coming through from your end. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you are having any technical problems, if you're having trouble hearing or seeing the three of us, you can shoot us a message using that Q&A button and someone on our staff will get back to you and help you troubleshoot the issue. Um, please note that while the authors are presenting, we ask that you use this Q&A button only for tech questions and just know that you will not be able to chat with your fellow attendees using that feature. Once the authors have presented, we will open things up to questions from the audience. Again, we'll be using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can type in your questions there if you have any for Maris and Angela, and then I'll be reading them aloud so that all the attendees and the authors can hear them. If you're a young reader who has a question for any of our authors, please um, be sure to add your first name as well as your age to your question so that we can make sure we get those kids' questions answered first. If you need any assistance, Typing in your question if you're a young reader, you'll have plenty of time to ask a parent or guardian for help. Finally, and most importantly, I just want to let everyone know, oh, sorry, I did skip one. Uh, all This is being recorded, so at the end of the day, and um, all of our sessions will be sent to anyone who registered for the event. So if you do have any audio or visual issues that weren't able to help you with, just know that this is being recorded and we're going to send it out so no one is going to miss out on any of the fun that we have here today. And now, finally, and most importantly, I just want to let everyone know that at Macmillan, we expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may at the discretion of the organizers be immediately removed from the event. So that takes care of all of our housekeeping issues. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to the authors and introduce our first guest teacher of the day, who is Angela Dominguez. Angela is the author and the illustrator of several books for children, including two Pora Bell Prey illustration honor books, Maria Had a Little Llama and Mango Abuela and Me. Angela, when she's not in the studio, she teaches art at the Academy of Art University. She also enjoys presenting at different schools and libraries to all sorts of kids. And she is, as a child, loved reading books and making a mess creating pictures. She's delighted to still be doing both and we are delighted to have her here with us today. Take it away, Angela. So hi everyone, um, I'm here with my trusty assistant Petunia wearing her favorite shark costume. Um, if you read my book, Stella Diaz Never Gives Up, um, you might see that there was a biscuit, a chihuahua named Biscuit who wore a shark costume. So um, she's inspired by Biscuit and she wanted to make an appearance today and talk about her love of the oceans with me. Um, she'll be in and out of the presentations too. Um, so today we're going to be talking about science and to kind of set the mood, we've got the oceans. Um, so let me begin with that I'm not a scientist, but I'm a huge science fan and uh, my boyfriend is a science teacher and through him I have learned to be even more curious about the world around me and I thought I would share some of what I've learned with him. But I'm also happy to talk about science because the oceans are a huge inspiration for Stella. Um, these are the longest books I've ever written in my life. You know, I used to write just picture books, which are like 32 pages. And then these books are like 200 pages. And honestly, when starting, I didn't know where to begin. I just knew I had this character named Stella. She loved the ocean. She was a little shy. And I was pretty sure she would want to know a lot of fun facts. Um, so I started the book the way I always started, which is by researching. Um, I like to do it online and at the library too. And um, it really helped me when trying to figure out the storylines. It helped me think about different ways to express how Stella was feeling. And so um, I'm gonna share now the facts that I learned whilst um, preparing for those books while writing them. So I'm gonna share with you all now. 
this PowerPoint that I made. Um, and I'm going to start first with two oceanographers that I really think are super interesting and then share 10 amazing uh, facts about the oceans. So first we have Jacques Cousteau. Uh, he was born in France in 1910. Uh, he's known as an explorer and an adventurer, but he wasn't always that way. Growing up, he was actually a very sickly kid and he built up his strength by swimming in the Mediterranean Sea. And when he was an adult, his good friend Philip um, shared with him a pair of goggles and he got to swim in the ocean and see everything underneath. And that opened his eyes to the underwater world. And that is what began his love of the oceans. And he's known for many things like his signature look, like the red cap and the turtleneck. Um, but he's also done TV programs and he did documentaries. He also invented something really amazing, which is called the aqua lung, which enables people to scuba dive freely. You know, like before the aqua lung, people had to wear all this heavy gear, which made them basically look like astronauts under the sea. And it looks cool, but it's really hard to move around. So thanks to Jacques Cousteau, we can go scuba diving today. And he also started this group called the Sea Musketeers, which inspired the name of Stella's Ocean Activist Group and Stella Diaz Never, Never Gives Up. Now, my, one of my personal heroes, Sylvia Earle. She's an activist and an oceanographer. She's also the first female chief scientist of the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And with her husband, Graham Hawks, they built this thing called, um, or sorry, this group called the Deep Ocean Engineering, which made it possible to explore the seas in these cool robotic submarines. And she also started Mission Blue, which is an organization that helps protect the oceans. And they have these hope spots around the world and they protect parts of the oceans that are really special and biodiverse, meaning that there's a lot of interesting different sea creatures there. And thanks to Sylvia, people can't disturb these hope spots and they remain preserved. So those are two oceanographers that are worth learning more about. I encourage you all to dive in with some biographies about them. But next I'm gonna share my top 10 amazing fish facts or ocean facts. And so the first one is the ocean is bigger than you think. It's enormous. It covers around 71% of the earth and we've only explored 5% of them, and there's a lot more to be explored. The oceans are also a giant museum. Imagine all the shipwrecks over thousands of years, so there's more artifacts in, from history in the ocean than there are in all the museums combined, which is kind of crazy. The ocean is also home to the biggest animal to ever live and that is the blue whale. Um, they're even bigger than the dinosaurs. Blue whales can grow over to 30 meters long and weigh more than 286,000 pounds. And everything on them is huge. Their tongue weighs as much as an elephant and its heart is the size of a car. And despite being so big, they actually eat really tiny food. Um, they eat this shrimp-like uh, thing called a krill, and they eat almost 80,000 pounds a day, which is a lot. Now, uh, fun fact number three, there's a lot of slime in the ocean. Um, sea creatures are slimy for many reasons. Uh, one of them is to help them get in and out of their homes, um, but they also have slime to warn predators that they are dangerous or poisonous to eat. So this is the mandarin fish here, there's other creatures like the nudie branch or the sea slug that also have um, slime on them. And a fun fact, uh, the green moray eel is actually blue, but it has a yellow cover of slime, which makes them look green, which is pretty slimy. Now, uh, there are unicorns in the sea, sort of. Um, they are called narwhals and they are actually real. I didn't think they were real until I started researching this book. Uh, what they have is a giant uh, tooth that looks like a horn and it's spiraled and only the male narwhals grow it. And it gets as long as 10 feet long and weighs more than 22 pounds. 
Um, they live in the Arctic Ocean, which is kind of hard to see. Um, so we don't see them very often. And they don't do well in captivity, which is why you'll never see them in an aquarium, which is kind of a bummer. Um, fun fact number five, jellyfish are amazingly weird. They're sort of like the Tin Man and the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz, because they don't have a heart and they don't have a brain. They don't have bones either or eyes. So, um, but these weird creatures have existed for millions of years, again, even before the dinosaurs. And some jellyfish are bioluminescent, meaning they can create their own light. But I, you might have heard this already, you don't wanna touch them. Um, even though they don't mean to try to hurt humans, if a person accidentally touches them, you know, it could sting you and some of them are even deadly. So that's scary. Now, this is not quite a fact. This is more of an opinion, but um, what is the cutest fish? To me, it's the puffer fish. Uh, it's also known as the blowfish or the balloon fish. And this cutie can inflate into a ball shape to evade predators. And they have these spines that are sharp that add another layer of defense. And if a fish eats it, they won't like it. They have a poisonous substance that makes them taste disgusting and can be even lethal. What is the ugliest fish? Now, I didn't vote for this guy, but in 2013, the ugliest, ugliest animal preservation society voted the blobfish as its official mascot. With a face only a mother could love, the blobfish lives off the coast of Australia and they aren't always blobby. They actually live very deep down in the ocean where there's a lot of atmospheric pressure. So when they are brought up to the surface, they actually look more like a normal fish. Fun fact number eight, um, octopuses are excellent escape artists. So we know they have eight arms and they can swim backwards, but they can escape from dangerous situations and predators pretty easily. Like they can shoot a giant cloud of ink and get away. They can also camouflage themselves into their surroundings. And they have been able to escape and cram their body into a hole only an inch wide, which is pretty amazing. Fun fact number nine, um, it's very dark at the bottom of the oceans. So it, that's because it's really far away from the sun. Um, it's the deepest part of the oceans that we know of is the Marinara, Marinara Trench, and it's about 11 kilometers or seven miles down, which is really far. And while it's dark, there's a lot going on. There are mountains and oceans. In fact, the longest mountain range in the world is found down there. It's called the Mid-Oceanic Range. Um, there's also um, fish and mammals that live down there, but a lot of them actually don't have eyes because it's so dark that they don't need it. Um, it's, that's kind of creepy or cool, depending on your perspective. Um, finally, my fun fact number 10 is that I wanted to give a shout out to some of the great aquatic dads. Now this fish, I think a lot of you know um, from Finding Nemo, the clownfish, and they are actually really great dads in real life. Um, while the female fish will lay about a thousand eggs, the male fish is actually the one that protects them. And isn't that a pretty good dad? Uh, another great dad is the seahorse. Their heads might look like a tiny horse, but don't be fooled. They are awesome dads. The male seahorse carries all the eggs in their brood pouch, which basically makes them look like a kangaroo for 45 days. So way to go, tiny dad. Um, now, this is not a fun fact, but um, there's a lot of plastics in the oceans and our oceans need our help. And it's hard to say how much plastics there is, but scientists think that roughly like 8 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean every year, which is kind of hard to imagine. So if you think about a ton equals an elephant, that's 8 million elephants worth of plastic going into the ocean every year. And a lot of this is single plastic use, like um, plastic bags, bottles, and straws too. 
but we can all make a difference by cutting back on how much plastic we use. And I do talk about that in Stella Diaz Never Gives Up, her pledge. These are a couple of her tips that she makes up with her friends. Um, you know, carry a reusable bottle. Uh, you can use plastic straws or no, say no to plastic straws and use like a silicone one or these really cool paper ones that usually have stripes on them. Uh, you can carry around a tote bag, you know, and if you want to, you could even make one. Um, and then say no to like plastic forks and knives. You know, if you're ordering takeout, just tell them no and use the ones you have from home. So um, I have a couple assignment ideas, you know, like you, there's a lot that I just talked about and maybe you wanna write or draw something. So the first idea is that you could do a drawing activity, um, draw yourself in a submarine surrounded by your favorite sea creatures. So some ideas is like, you know, thinking about what you would see in that submarine. Would it be corals? Would it be mammals? Would it be crustaceans? Um, you know, could be even a fantastical creature like a mermaid. Uh, second is to write something and you could write about an adventure that you'd like to take with either like Jacques Cousteau or Sylvia Earle, or maybe even Stella could come along too. And just write about what you would see. Um, if you're, itching to learn more about um, you know, the oceans and sea creatures, I really recommend National Geographic Kids. Um, Blue Planet is a great documentary series. And then the Shed Aquarium is, has all these great videos up on their website. Um, what's really fun about it right now is that they have these little penguins that um, are going around the different exhibits and it's super cute and uh, it's a really fun to follow along. And finally, if you want to learn more about Stella and the oceans, um, you can visit Stella Diaz's website. Um, you can sign Stella's pledge to cut down on plastics. Uh, you can find even more resources to um, protect the oceans and learn more about them. And there's a pretty cool activity sheet too. And so thank you for listening. Um, I'm excited to see what you all come up with. So is Petunia in her little shark outfit. Um, feel free to tag me on Twitter and share what you've written or drawn. I would love to see it. Um, but now I think we're with Maris and I would love to learn what she has to talk about. All right, thank you so much, Angela. That was so fun. Um, I definitely second your vote for cutest fish. So I think we can consider that a fact now. Um, moving on now, I'm excited to introduce our second science teacher of the day, Maris Wicks. Maris is the author of Human Body Theater, as well as illustrator of the New York Times bestselling Primates with Jim Ottaviani. When she's not making comics, Maris works as a program educator at the New England Aquarium. Take it away, Maris. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. And I'm going to amend your bio just a tiny bit. I'm no longer a program educator, um, but that's okay. I still do work with the aquarium as a freelancer. So I have done some education programs with them, but I, I've been full time uh, writing and drawing comics for five years now, which is super fun. So what I want to talk to you all today is about two of my favorite things, science and comics. And I'm going to tell you how, actually, I'm going to show you how I make comics about science, but uh, I want to tell you that I learned to do this from book reports. So I can't see you raise your hands, but just if you've ever had to do a book report, just raise your hands. I've definitely had to do one. <laughs> so, and I actually, book reports are one of my favorite things to do in school. So let me share my screen so you can see real Maris and cartoon Maris. Let's see, cartoon Maris. There I am. So yeah, um, in addition to doing comics, I spent 15 years uh, doing informal science education. So that means science education, not in the classroom. So I have taught environmental science education at, um, um, at lots of summer camps. I worked at the Children's Museum in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, for a year, so I've done museum ed, and then eight years at the aquarium doing uh, program education. And that meant either taking uh, animals you might find at the ocean into classrooms or doing presentations in the aquarium building itself. And this is the aquarium in Boston. So I would like to talk to you about 
the science comics I've done and say, well, why, why comics about science? And for me, science comics can take you places you can't go. They can take you, oh, sorry, inside the human body. Um, this is one of the books I worked on a human body theater. It's a very cartoony approach to exploring the inside. So I'm working with real scientific fact, but then I'm also doing cartoony stuff. And I do this because this is the way that I see, like I can't help not see cartoons when I'm learning things. When I was a kid in middle school and high school, most of my notes for science classes and math class and history class had little cartoons at the bottom. Um, I also did another book called Science Comics Coral Reefs, and science comics or comics can take you into the ocean. And this is not just about corals in general, but it's about the whole ocean. So I wanted to figure out a way that cartoons and comics could take you places, show you things, teach you things, but also do it in a way that is engaging. Um, as a student, I had a lot of difficulty reading and writing, um, mostly in middle school and high school because there wasn't a lot of hands-on things for me to do. Elementary school was a lot easier because there was just stuff that I could do, like you know, build things or make things. And when it got down to being a lot more reading and writing, it was a little harder. So I think about how I learn and then package how I learn a thing for other folks using comics and cartoons. Now, I don't always work alone. I've worked with Jim Ottaviani, that's him on the left-hand side, um, cartoon Jim, of course. And when I talk a little bit about today, I'm gonna to be putting some words in him, his mouth because I do wanna talk about writing comics, um, but the book that I'm gonna be talking about, he wrote and I illustrated. So we've worked together before on Primates, um, and Primates talked about uh, Jane Goodall right here, Diane Fossey, and Berate Galdikas, and the respective animals they studied, chimpanzees, uh, mountain gorillas, and orangutans. So science comics can take you into the jungles of Africa or Indonesia. And I didn't get to go to any of these places. I did research and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a bit. But we're gonna go to space today. The most recent book that Jim and I worked on is called Astronauts, Women on the Final Frontier. And it goes into space. Now, I didn't get to go into space for this book, but I did the next best thing. And it's the same thing that you would do to do a book report. So how do you make science comics? Well, first you pick a topic or a subject. And in this case, Jim had an idea. He had been working on a book called T minus, and he came across a story about 13 women pilots that took the same or some of the same tests as the astronaut candidates in the 1960s. Now, Back in the 1960s, when they were going to send people into space in the US, you had to be a test pilot. And women were not allowed to be test pilots. But there was a scientist that was like, you know what? I bet women would be good at doing these tests too. Just because they can't be test pilots doesn't mean they can't be good astronauts. So I don't want to spoil too much because I talk about the history in the book. But it's, it's basically an example of questioning what things are like and then being like, is this fair? is this okay? And kind of pushing those questions because those are important questions to ask in science. But it would be really hard to have a book about 13 different people. So I'd like to introduce you to Mary Cleave. Mary Cleave joined the astronaut sh uh, space shuttle class in uh, I think the year before I was born in 1980. And she is the narrator for, the, for this book. And I'm telling you this information because it's, it's all part of the research part. So Jim decided that Mary's story was a pretty fun story and she would be a great narrator to take us through the astronauts book. So he started reading and researching and looking for reference. And this is what the beginning of a book looks like. These are little tiny bits of scenes or parts that are interesting on post-its on a big poster board. This is just like the beginnings of a book, the, the baby version of a book. Um, and Jim and I work similarly. So like I said, I'm talking about his process, but it's also similar for me. Once you start to get a good idea of what you want in the book, you can write longer paragraphs. And I don't have an assistant, unfortunately, but Jim does. This is Pepper the Cat. She's a very good editorial assistant. Uh, we also have a human editor for books. And editors are kind of like teachers. At every major stage of making a book, an editor is going to be looking at those stages and saying, this looks great, this needs some work, or this part's not clear and we need to work on it. 
So it's, we're not making these books completely on our own. There's lots of other people helping make these books the best that they can be. Now, once all of those paragraphs start to come together in a book, this is a script. Now, this is where I start to join the picture because once the script is there and it gets approved, I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it. Um, I need to see this story in my head so I can start to draw it. And a comic script a lot of times looks like a play or like a movie script. So if you ever had to read a play for, for, um, for things, this is essentially what it looks like. It sets the scene, it has panels. And people who read comics, you don't ever get to see this part, even though this part is really important. It's basically the instructions for the artist to tell the story. So Jim has given me lots of little pieces to do research. So I get reading. This is just a handful of the books that I read. And I didn't even write Astronauts, but I needed to read and look at these books to help give me idea of what the story would look like, what the space shuttle looks like, what the Soyuz rocket in Russia looks like. So all of these different places in these real people, I needed to see what they looked like. Now, the next step is collecting all the photo reference. And you might have noticed that I draw pretty cartoony but I use a lot of photos to inform my drawings. Um, like I said, I'm drawing real people in real places, so I need to do my homework. I need to do my research. The first part for me is doing thumbnails. This is the sketchy part of the book. This is where um, I'm putting in the layout and all the text and all these things, and the whole book gets thumbnailed, gets sketched out, and I send it off to our editor. If it looks good, this is like kind of the first, the first big draft, um, if it looks good, I can move on to the pencils. And this is where I'm looking closer at my photo references. Like I said, real people, real places. Um, and I'm doing the whole book like this, sending it off. And then if, it, if we get the go ahead, inks. And up until inks, I've been working digitally. I work on a computer with a tablet, but I print out my art and I ink on top of it. So these are done by hand, ink, and then I scan them back in, and then coloring. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you about how comics get made is because when you hold a book in your hand or you watch an animated show or a movie, that's the finished product. But we don't get to see the work that goes into it. And I think that when you understand how something is made, you can, well, one, it makes it a little bit easier to think about how you could do something like that. And two, you understand how it came to exist. It took me 18 months to draw astronauts. That would be like if you went through a grade and a half of all of your classes were just that one project. So like I said, it's important to see how this stuff gets made. And uh, I don't just use photo reference. This is my little, little teeny tiny astronaut toy that I have. It's just basically an astronaut and an EVA, like a, um, a EVA is like when you go outside of space vehicle and do work. And the panel on the left-hand side is basically the reference I used it for. So I have these little guys that I would take pictures of and it just, anything that helps construct the world is great. And I, I say this to people who maybe you want to do a comic about dinosaurs, grab a bunch of dinosaur toys and like pose them and stuff and use them as, as models. And I totally do that. It's a, it's a, you don't have to just come up with all the stuff in your head. I want to read to you just one excerpt from uh, <clears throat> from astronauts. Um, and then I have a little assignment for you as well. So we're going to jump into a space shuttle mission. This is Mary Cleave. And I'll, I'll, I'll do her voice. I was the flight engineer on STS 61B. So I had to be able to find our navigation stars in case we needed backup for the star tracker device. So you got to adapt your eyes to the dark. You have a bag that you put around the window and then you look out and you find your nav stars, you know, before you really need them. So my first day up in orbit, I go out into the little bag, hang out, and I look out. I mean, you have never seen the stars. Even if you've been out in a dark sky, you've never seen the stars without an atmosphere in the way, messing with your view. I mean, air is not overrated, but... It's, it's breathtaking. And then I think, oh, sugar, I'm never gonna find the nav stars. I'm used to seeing just a constellation or two, and now, okay, this is why we do this before a nav computer failure. Deep breath. The colors, they're, 
I wanted to read you this part because science for me is wonder. And you're seeing astronaut Mary Cleave in space. She's done this training and she's having like a aha, like a wow moment in space. So none of us, whether we're just starting out learning about this stuff or we're a trained astronaut in space are immune to having wow moments. So um, science for me, and I feel like it can be this way for everyone. It just, it depends on your relationship to it, can be really fun. So I have two assignments for you. Your first assignment is to find something that makes you go, wow, this is the moon. I took this picture from my front stoop. I live in the city, there's a fair amount of light pollution, but I, uh, about five years ago, I bought myself a telescope, but you can look through binoculars, you can even just look with your naked eyes, and it doesn't have to be space. Um, I'm kind of confined to my neighborhood right now, like a lot of us are, so I have a tiny backyard, and I spend a lot of time looking around in the grass and just looking to see if I can find worms and stuff, and I'm like a grown-up doing this, but I, I love worms, I can't help it. So look for something in the everyday that you might have overlooked that can make you go, wow. And your other assignment, if you choose to accept, is to make a science comic. Think about it like a book report. Do some research, do some sketches. Think about, is there a story that I could tell with a comic? Maybe it's just a fun fact. Maybe it's one of the fun facts that Angela shared with you. Make a comic out of that. Um, but think of, think of a way that you could use comics or cartoons to express an idea that you're excited about. So that is it for me. Thank you very much for coming. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. And now I'm back. And I, I hopefully did okay time-wise. You did amazing time-wise. <laughs> it was perfect. Good. Good. Um, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see everybody's science comics. I'm sure we have a lot of attendees who are going to come up with some really cool things. This is now the time where we're going to move over into our question and answer section of the presentation. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Angela or Maris, again, we are using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and type in your question. We'll be looking at them and I'll read them aloud for the authors and for everyone else to hear. Um, if you are a young reader who has a question for Angela and Maris, just remember to add your name, your, only your first name and your age so that we can make sure those kid questions go to the top of our queue. And if you need help um, typing in your question, that would be a great time to have a guardian or parent help you. As those questions come in, we're going to kick things off with a question that we had sent in in advance from a reader. And they would like to know, how old do I have to be to write and publish a book and how? So give your best advice. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so there's no rule to age. I'll say that what I like to tell people, especially young folks, is that I'm 38. I've been drawing since I could hold a crayon. Um, but there's no rule or rhyme or reason. I will say, you know, a lot of what I do takes practice. I'm still practicing drawing every day. Like I'm, I'm never going to be the best at what I do. I want to keep learning. And that's part of what you have to accept. And when you read the books that I talked about, you don't see the countless projects that were rejected or that never became books. Like there are lots of ideas that never make it to book form. Um, I'm trying to think of resources. I, I don't know if Macmillan does. I know that, uh, Matt Kids, I know that First Second has done a couple like FAQs about like, what is it like to submit a manuscript and to get a book published? So if you're, um, I would say, if you're thinking seriously about writing or, and art as a career, there are some resources online that answer those questions about what, how do you get a book published? And I, I say there's not a lot of like black and white answers there's a lot of gray and it's different for each book it's different for each creator um and it's i don't want to say it's not easy but nothing in life is easy it's just it's it can be it can be a challenge um yeah i would agree with that i mean it's i likewise i've been drawing and making books in my own way since i was little and i am 37 and i went to art school so it's it's been my whole life and i've worked really hard at it 
but it doesn't mean that you don't have a great idea. I think just if you keep working hard at it, um, and uh, there's great books that teach you how to make books, like, you know, there's the making comic books, if you wanted to do it as a comic, or there's books that teach you how to do it as a picture book, there's workshops. So if you love the idea of making your own book, I definitely encourage you to pursue it, but just realize it takes a lot of hard work to do it and um, learn as much as you can so that when you're ready and your great idea is perfect, you can submit it and, you know, good luck. All right, we have a question from Emmy, age eight, who would like to know, why did you want to make books that were about science? Do you want to go first, Angela? Sure. Um, so I've always liked science, um, but you know, I would say I've always loved like art and writing first. But when I started thinking about Stella, it was really Stella that motivated me to want to try to write more about science because I knew that this was a girl who's really shy, but she loved. Um, sea creatures and she loved the aquariums and she could get lost in this world. So um, thinking about that character really inspired me to want to write more about science. And then it's kind of like once you discover this really cool, interesting thing, you just want to learn even more about it. So with every Stella book, I've been trying to incorporate more and more and it's definitely influenced like my writing in general. And I have always loved science and art equally. But by the time I had to make a decision with education after high school, I felt like I had to choose art or science. And I chose, well, it's not choosing it, but I decided to go to school for art. There's pretty much no hardcore science department in the college that I went to, but there was access to draw things from life. So there was a whole nature lab that you could check out like animals and organisms and look at microscope slides and use those to inspire you. Um, Turns out though, I didn't have to choose. I spent those 15 years after college working in informal science ed. And part of the reason why I felt like I maybe had to make that choice is because I wasn't um, what you would consider academically great at school. Like I said in my presentation, I'm a hands-on learner. So uh, it was really hard for me in high school to maintain good grades. I had a lot of hard time focusing. I didn't test well. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, not smart. Like, I, like I, I took me by the time to get to grown up. I'm like, wait, I'm actually like, okay. It just, it was a hard time for me to figure out how I learned best. And I know there's a lot of kids probably watching this today being like, oh, I know how I learn best. And it's really hard for me when it's a, it's a difficult way. Like I really, I still don't like tests and it's still hard for me to read academic writing. And I have to sometimes for, for, for work. But I, I figured that I could smoosh together two things that I loved so much because science just kept coming back to me. So I smooshed them with comics and I'm like, oh, maybe I can do what I love. I can teach w by using comics about science things. And it's, it's literally a dream job. And it has been my dream, so dream job since I've been in my early 20s. But it didn't happen naturally. And now there's like SciComm science communication is a thing. And there's a lot more people out there working hard to make science accessible using comics, cool graphics, videos. So it's the landscape has changed a lot in 20 years and like the, the best way possible. Like I'm sure there's plenty of you out there who like love watching science YouTubes. Like I, Deep Look is one of my favorites, a PBS one. It's like all macro uh, video and it's just like a really cool way to get to learn about things in a way that's really engaging. Awesome. Our next question is from Cora, age seven. She'd like to know what your favorite part of writing or illustrating a book is. Oh, uh, I'm gonna, do you, mind, do you mind if I go first, Angela? That's fine. <laughs> I didn't think that I could write a book until my late 20s, because um, the first book I worked on was with Jim, Primates, and I, I really had ideas in my head, but I didn't think I could write. Part of the reason was because I didn't do particularly well in English class in high school. Um, so right now, after I've written a few books, my favorite part is the research. Well, okay, it's the research and then it's finishing. Because <laughs> I love the research. I love learning new things. I love the wow factor of, of doing research for a new book. But I'm also really happy when a book is done because that means I get to share it with everybody. And everything in between the research and the book is like a lot of work, but it's like both parts are, both parts are my favorite, the very beginning and the very end. Um, for illustrating, I love coming up with the characters, like they're the heart of the story for me. So once I have an idea of what that character looks like, it's really exciting and it gives me ideas for the story. Um, 
I love coming up with an outline, which I didn't think I would love doing so much, but that's where you're figuring out what's going to happen like in every chapter and how the story begins and ends and that interesting middle part where things get complicated. Um, I agree like that first draft is the hardest thing to do and I really don't enjoy doing it. But once you get all your thoughts onto paper, that's when it starts becoming super fun again, because then you can revise it. And that's always what makes the story great. All right, our next question is from Ben, age nine. He would like to know what you both like to do besides writing and illustrating. You, you can go first. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I've gotten this question a lot lately, and um, right now I really enjoy baking um, and cooking. I, I love watching those kind of shows, and I love like seeing the wonderful things they make and wonder if I can try doing it. So it's my biggest hobby right now, and it's a nice way to kind of um, get distracted when things are a little stressful. Um, and then outside of that, um, because I just love like nature, I love going hiking and exploring the outdoors. I like camping some. So I think like being outdoors and baking is probably like my top two things. I am very similar. <laughs> I bake and I cook to deal with stress, but I also love baking and cooking. Um, prior to working in education, I worked in food for a while and I was a pie baker. So it's like my happy place. And then usually when I take vacations, it's all outdoorsy. So I'm either um, camping or hiking and nature based. I love birding. I love whale watches. I love just like sitting belly down on a dock and watching fish all day. Like that's like my happy place. Um, I do really love scuba. I learned to scuba dive for working on coral reefs. And when I generally take like one dive, one big like dive trip every two years. Um, and yeah, just being outdoors and eating food is just like the two. <laughs> it's like my favorite things and it's I don't know but uh I will say when I really want to like chill out or be inspired I read a lot of comics and I watch a lot of cartoons and animation my favorite like I process the world in a very cartoony way so a lot of times animated movies or cartoon shows resonate with me and I have an easier time focusing on a show than I like an animated show than I might with a movie or a live action show all right, we have time for one more question. We're gonna make it a quick one from Caleb, who would like to know if you both like sea turtles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, is there someone out there who doesn't like a sea turtle? Because we could probably convince you that they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love them. I do have one in my background here. <laughs> so I think they are amazing and adorable. Have you, this is going to be my weird sea turtle fact. They have the coolest esophagus. They have spikes that line their whole esophagus so that when they eat their food, whether it's like a fish or kelp, they can puke out seawater while still keep swallowing. And uh, there's a lot of aquatic birds that have a similar thing too, penguins as well. Wow. <laughs> Maybe like a cute slash gross fun fact. Yeah. That. I've learned so many things today. <laughs> That concludes our uh, science lesson for the day. Thank you so much to Maris and Angela to be as our guest teachers. It was great Thank having you. you. Um, just to let everyone know again, a reminder that this is being recorded and the videos will be distributed to anyone who registered for the event. So we will definitely be sharing those far and wide as soon as we have them available, along with some additional information about Maris and Angela's books and where you can get them either from your local bookstore or borrowed through your library. If you have anything that you'd like to share with us, any drawings that you did from Angela and Maris's prompts, anything like that, you can share them with us via social media at Mac Kids Books. You can tag Angela and Maris as well, or you can send them to us via email at kidsschoolandlibrary at macmillanusa.com, which was the email that you received your confirmation from. So you can just reply right to that email. And we will see everyone tomorrow for social studies. So thank you guys. Yay, thank you. Bye. <laughs>